when I saw that picture last night, certainly it was a sucker punch. I think for me and for a lot of people from minority communities, it really makes you start to think, when is this ever going to end? You work so hard, you go to school, you know you have to be just a little bit better than the next person because you have to prove just a little bit more. You succeed, you go on in your career, maybe you even become the mayor. And then you're reminded in the worst possible way that people you respect, people you admire, people who are allies in the battle with you still need a little bit of education. And to me, what is deeply troubling here is not the hot takes on the election and the politics. Look, this will have, I think, very little impact. People have made up their minds on issues like this uh, and from a very base political level. What bothers me is that we have not made the space in this country to have a real conversation about what is happening in terms of our diverse, pluralistic ideal in this nation. So yeah, I happen to think the Prime Minister and I are the same age, so I happen to think that when I was 29 in 2001, in a world that was awakening in its racial consciousness, in a work, world where Islamophobia was on the rise, even before the events of later that year, that I probably would have stopped and thought, well, this is not an appropriate thing to do. Do I think that the Prime Minister was acknowledging or, or actively being a racist? Do I think that he looked at himself in the mirror on the way to the party and said, wow, this is super racist and I'm going to do it anyway? Of course not. Of course not. But I think we have to ask ourselves why enough people in 2001 thought that was okay. Where enough people thought it was okay to take a picture of that, to put it in a yearbook, why no one said anything about it for nearly two decades. And certainly casual racism in our community today is different now. It still exists, but it's different. But as someone told me just last week, even these tiny things, a ton of feathers still weighs a ton. How do you complain about not and so, when you're the highest paid leader in the let him finish. And you're Is it still not working? It's, it's I'm not starting work. again. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? We got the backup. It was on a roll there. Hmm? Um, Where were we? So, why in 2001 some people thought it was okay to do that, some people thought it was okay to take a picture of it and put it in the yearbook, and no one said anything about it for 20 years? And certainly casual racism today is different. You couldn't get away with that without looking in the mirror and going, wow, this is super racist. But it still exists. You know, people wear indigenous headsets at music, or headdresses at music festivals. It still exists. And these things may seem small. They see, may seem minor. But as uh, someone told me last week, they may be feathers. But a ton of feathers still weighs a ton. And so it's time for us as a nation to have a discussion not just about these casual things. But it's time for us to understand that we live in a country where today we have a provincial government that says a Muslim woman will be denied a promotion that her Muslim male co-worker is eligible for because of her faith. Where people have to choose between their faith and their job. Where we have political parties actively promoting policies that scare people, that divide people, that, in, that engage people in snitching on their neighbors and calling them different culturally from themselves. This is wrong because it's wrong as human beings. This is stuff that we cannot stand for. It's also wrong because it's bad for our country. If we are a nation that does not welcome people and make them feel welcome when they get here, then we cannot succeed economically. We just can't. We don't have the luxury anymore to indulge ourselves in this kind of craven division in our political environment. So if anything, this galvanizes me and it makes me think hard 
about my own role and all of our roles in standing up for what we really believe in and the kind of country we want and telling those who aspire to lead us what is and is not acceptable. And I want to be clear about one other thing. I don't like the moral equivalence that I hear in these hot takes on this issue that says, oh, listen, because the Prime Minister has a photo of this or two or three incidents of doing this, then he now is somehow brokered away from speaking out against intolerance, that he's lost the credibility or legitimacy to do that. We all have to do it every day. And we have to judge those who want to lead us in the totality of their record. So it is, in fact, fair for the Prime Minister to say, look, I was stupid. And yeah, he was stupid in doing all of this. But I have also spent my time in this role fighting for the rights of everyone. That is a fair statement. It is an equally fair statement for others to question other political leaders and saying, well, it's not just that you did something stupid 15 years ago or you made a speech in Parliament. It's the totality of your record since then. You know, and thinking about what we can actually believe going forward. We live in a world where, in recent years, things that were not polite in, in company before have become okay to say, have become acceptable. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. None of our political leaders have the courage to speak out against Bill 21 in Quebec in a very serious way. They lack the courage because the bill is too popular and they're worried about losing votes. So let's ask ourselves the true question, why is it so popular? And how do we take responsibility for that by making sure that we, those of us who aspire to lead, are leading in a way that enhances the dignity of everyone here? Now there's, now there's been rumors for a while that you would, uh, you may be running um, as a federal liberal. I'm not going to ask you whether or not you can, <laughs> you can confirm those, but hypothetically, if you were, would you feel comfortable uh, running as a liberal under Trudeau? Look, I don't want to be, I don't want to be critical of the media because I never do that. But that question is exactly the wrong question to ask today. I'm happy to answer it. I have no interest in running in federal politics, so it's a completely. Uh, irrelevant question for us, but that is exactly the conversation we don't want to be having right now. It's not about politics. It's not about who's running for what. It's about understanding what kind of vision for this country that we need and in pushing hard towards that vision. Prime Minister has apologized. What would be your guidance to him if he needs to do anything else or does he need to do anything else? Listen, what else can you do, right? Do we want to extract a huge pound of flesh from everyone who made a mistake? I've made tons of mistakes. I apologize all the time. They're not usually that dumb, I hope. <laughs> but what we have to do is take that at face value and say, all right, so what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about this going forward? You know, what does this actually mean for us going forward? And I think that's a fair question to ask all of our political uh, parties and all of those who aspire to leadership in our community. And so the other thing that I want to say, and I'll take a page out of Mr. Singh's book here, because he articulated this so well last night when he said, those of us who have lived that life, those of us who have lived the feathers and sometimes the sticks uh, of aggression against us because of what we look like or because of our faith, really saw this as a sucker punch. Not because of who it was, but because it was still happening. And I'm sure that a lot of young people today are saying to themselves, is the story of the country that I've grown up in a lie? Will, no matter how hard I work, no matter what I do, no matter what I achieve, is this crap always going to keep happening to me and to people that look like me? And I think it's important for us to remember the promise of this nation. I will never stop being a proud Canadian, and I will never stop fighting for what this promise of this place is and what we are capable of achieving together. And I want to say to the young people particularly, who have been particularly touched or hurt by the conversations that have been going on, not just yesterday, not just the day before, but over the last many months in this province, that Canada is worth fighting for. That you belong here just as I belong here, that every single one of us deserves a life of dignity and opportunity right here. And certainly there are those of us who will keep fighting for you at this level, but we will keep that struggle because this country is worth the fight.
This is a really hard question because on the one hand, I want to decry this gotcha kind of thing and tell people look at the totality of the record. But in so many cases, we don't know the totality of the record unless we hear these things. And so somehow we've got to find the balance because people have a right to know who they're voting for, but we also have a right to look at people on their total record. You know, uh, and to me, that's the hard part here because it'd be so easy for me to say as a politician, just ignore all that stuff. But you know what? You're voting for me and you gotta know who I am. But I would also urge every citizen to look at the big picture. You know, and ask yourself, for example, is it enough that a candidate says, although I am opposed personally to LGBTQ plus rights, I won't actually do anything about it going forward, okay? Is that fair, is that right, is that enough? Or do we look at someone who says, I've done some really dumb things before, but I've learned from them, and if you look at my record in government, these are the things that I have fought for and what I truly believe in? I think that's important. I think what's uninteresting is one of the questions I heard on the plane yesterday, which was essentially, well, you have ethnic friends, what do they think of this? Right? And, I, and I felt like pointing out that the names that were given, you know, those people are from India, and he was dressed as someone from the Arab world, and those are totally different parts of the world. <laughs> Sometimes we forget such things. Um, I think that's unhelpful. I think that we have to take a more nuanced and a more sophisticated view of all of this, but we also have to understand that this is tough, that this is serious, and that we have been reckless. That we've been reckless in letting people play with that tapestry of plurality that makes this country work. It's super fragile. You start pulling on threads, the whole thing can unravel. And we've been careless, and we've been reckless, and we have taken it for granted. And people from minority communities have seen that, and we have to stop. So what's changed in 18 years? How come in Ottawa not only could someone have the makeup on, but it goes to a year old? And you reference this as well, if you're the same age, and you've dug many of those appropriate. But what's, in two decades, why has that changed? I, I don't want to make it sound like it has completely changed. I betcha, I betcha anything, that there were Halloween parties last year where people did the same thing, and they didn't think it was a racist thing to do. Uh, certainly in the circles that I move in, back in 2001, I would have gone, dude, <laughs> that's not cool, that's not right. I was very hip when I was 28, I suppose, but... <laughs> But at the same time, we have to be able to say, yes, casual racism is bad. We have to fight against it. But you know, people who look like me, every day of your life you encounter it. And you just learn how to deal with it. Every person of color has jokes. You know, a buddy of mine uh, recently uh, is, a, is a media commentator, and recently someone told him, get back on your camel and go back to where you came from. I had to check to see if there were camels in Tanzania or India. It turns out there are in northern India. But he responded with, don't be ridiculous, I don't have my camel. This is the 21st century. I use a camel share service, which was super funny. And every one of us has jokes. We have ways of sloughing this off and saying, yeah, it's not a big deal. And that stuff's important. But what I worry about is not the improvement over the last 18 years, I worry about the backsliding over the last 18 months. You know, in the last election in 2015, we had a party that was talking about barbaric cultural practices and snitch lines and telling women of a certain faith how they can and could not, what they could and could not wear. And generally, the voters said, well, that's no good, right? And in the time since then, and particularly in the last couple of years, we've backslid in a very big way.